So now what I want to do for this second half of today is I'm going to talk about what is machine learning, like at a fundamental level, like what is it really, how do neural networks work. Every, almost everything we do in this class is going to be an application of a neural network. So I want to really take the time to try to understand it uh, from the ground up. And then, um, and I, I think this part should take like, th I think 30 minutes, hopefully not more. Um, and I'll also be talking a little bit about like machine learning uh, contemporarily, like what are its applications? What are people doing with it? You know, not just in terms of the creative fields, but also, you know, like in industry and academia, well, you know, more generally speaking. And uh, after that, I'm going to, we're going to do like some fun things in our own computers, provided that the internet is good and strong for everybody. We'll do some little quick demos. And then I'll talk about what I'd like, like a simple thing that I'd like for you guys to, in fact, we'll even do a little test of the internet later. Um, and then I'll do a little fun thing at the end, like a little, my little surprise for everyone. And then at the, and then hopefully we have like five or 10 minutes left over is suggested that to have to leave some room for like a Q and A if people are interested in asking questions. Um, I assume we'll kind of be more interactive the next few days, but, but we'll definitely try to leave some time in for today to do that. So, um, okay, well, let's get into machine learning. So what is machine learning, right? Like, um, what does it really mean, right? People hear a lot, like, people hear, if you read the news, you always hear articles like, an AI did this, and an AI did that, and it's usually like, AI did blank, which human beings did. Did, right? So it doesn't really give you a lot of information about what AI is or what machine learning is, how do these terms uh, intersect, overlap. Um, and the truth is that there's not, not actually very any clear answers. Like even academics who are serious scientists will debate what the bounds of these words are. Um, a lot of people are very upset at the contemporary usage of, the, of artificial intelligence because artificial intelligence used to mean something that would basically be intelligent like a human being. And now it means a lot, lot less than that. Um, it means like people use the word AI for everything. And some scientists who maybe take the word too seriously are very upset about that. And so they try to invent new terms that mean, so like now we talk about artificial general intelligence, which is what AI used to be. Um, actually, like my favorite joke about what is AI, um, there's, there's kind of two things. There's two, two jokes. One is, AI is anything that computers can't do yet, right? So that's AI. Um, or AI is, or, or actually, no, this is, this is just technology, but you could say it about AI. AI is anything that, that um, wasn't, didn't exist before you were born, or something like that. Um, and, uh, and, and actually, like, if you go back to the field, when it emerged, the term AI came into being in the 1950s, something like that. And at that time, it basically meant what we now mean by computer science, right? There was no computer science in the 1950s. There was just artificial intelligence, right? The, the kind that Alan Turing talked about and people like, people like that. And over time, computer science developed and there were all these other things that went into it that didn't seem like AI. You know, like programming languages and compilers, while very difficult, are not AI, right? So, so then you have this sort of field emerging and then machine learning actually came as a term uh, much later. So through the 50s, people were really, really excited. Do I have a slide about this? Oh, I don't actually. So in the, let me show you. Um, so in the 1950s, right, we, d we first developed in 1957 this, this thing right here. Has anyone ever seen this picture? This is a, the Mark I perceptron. And it's basically a neural network which has 40, I think, uh, or 200, so, uh, let's see if I remember this right, sodium, uh, so, I forget, like sodium calcite or something like that, basically photocells. They're photocells, analog photocells, that are controlled by motors, and it can do really, really, really simple image classification of things in the water. Like, like it can find, it was developed by the US Navy, and it would do things like tell you if a battle, if there's a battleship in the ocean or something like that. And when uh, when we first were able to do this, th this by the way, like this is 400 cells, 400 neurons, in the neural network is now so small that like you 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 know you can't even believe it. Like you can, this is microscopic now. You couldn't even see it with a naked eye. Um, and when we first saw this in 1957, 
the uh, whole world like became very excited for the first time about AI. So like uh, this was the New York Times, what they wrote about it. So this is New York Times in 1958, or 19, yeah, 1958, when there was five cents. This is what they wrote about when they, when they first saw the, the Perceptron, they wrote, new Navy device learns by doing. Psychologist shows embryo of computer designed to read and grow wiser. Right, so um, the Navy revealed the embryo of an electronic computer today that it expects will be able to walk, talk, see, write, reproduce itself, <laughs> and be conscious of its existence. So that's like really radical stuff, right? Like for late 1950s. Um, so and and if you and if you know like about like what oops, yeah what like what the new, what the 1960s were like, right? So like in the 1960s, the early 60s especially, um, all of the like TV shows and cartoons they were all like hyper futuristic and very modern. Like everyone was like, oh, artificial intelligence is right. We just invented artificial intelligence. And basically, like the pioneers of the day, they said, like in 1970, uh, computers will be smarter than human beings, like for sure. Like the like Marvin Minsky, who is like one of the fathers of AI, recently died, said that uh, computers will achieve human level intelligence by 1970. So like if you re you watch like the Jetsons. Anyone watch the Jetsons? Remember the cart? Maybe that was I don't know if that was popular outside of America. But it was basically a cartoon that was all about how amazing the future would be, right? Everyone was in flying cars, and they had their their maid was a robot, and you know, that, and there was, so we were very, very sort of like forward thinking and hyper futuristic. And what happened was that by the end of the '60s, people were like, "Where's my AI?" You know, like it's not it's not here yet. And so what happened was that the public basically lost interest in AI. And so through the 1970s and the 1980s. There was no, uh, there was actually like very little public interest in in the topic of AI because they were kind of disappointed. Like they, you know, they moved on to the next thing. So this is what was called the AI winter. So in the 70s and 80s, and really like through the 90s and 2000s, there was a there there this field which had been in the public eye had been part of TV shows and cartoons and stuff. It kind of died away and it became like just an academic thing again. And uh, so, and during this time is when machine learning first uh, first evolved. So in the 1980s, people began to, computer scientists began to try to apply this field of computational statistics, which is like using probability and statistics to model functions. They tried to apply that to problems in AI. And that's kind of what machine learning more or less means. It was like, if you have a lot of data, can you train a function to do a task that would be otherwise hard for a computer to do. And that was the, that was the thing that began to be studied seriously in the 1980s. And, uh, and I got into it in 2007, 2008. And even then, it was like my first machine learning class. I'm not that old. Like, it was just you know, 10 years ago. But at that time, machine learning, there would be like one uh, class for, that would be at a graduate level. And there'd be maybe 20 students in it, so there'd be like like one, you know, class in the computer science department. And now it's like complete. Now it's like, a, you know, now it's gigantic. It's like auditoriums way bigger than this are now like introductory machine learning classes. And the reason for that is because starting around five, ten years ago, these things began to seriously perform um, in a way that that, they, that had been very speculative up until that time. Um, so what is machine learning, right? Like at a, at like conceptually. So the idea of machine learning is, let's say you have some problem that you want to model, like uh, predicting, predicting the weather, right? It's a really, really hard problem to tell if it's going to rain or not, for example. Um, but it, but uh, you, know, you, can, you can try to write a program that would look at all the data and then you know, create, and you know, what's programming like? It's like if statements and for loops and things like that, and looking up data and things of that sort. And, and it would be really, really difficult for you to write a program that would predict whether or not it's going to rain, because the program would be way too complicated. So instead of writing a program explicitly by hand, you can instead uh, make a program which is, which is a little different. It's like a function. So what's a function? You know, a function is like any function that you learn in linear algebra, right? f of x equals 3x plus 5, right? That's a function. 
And the idea of this function is that it's a line, right? It's just a line. And the function, depending on what these numbers, 3 and 5, are, so if it's 3x plus 5, it looks like this, right? If it's 2x minus 4, it looks like this. If it's negative 3x plus 6, it looks like that, right? Something like that. So depending on how you set the numbers, you change the function, right? And uh, so the idea is, what if you have a function which is capable of any, arb like an arbitrary shape, like a function that can look like this, it can look like that, it can look like any possible shape, right? And, uh, and then you don't know what the numbers are, the, the, the coefficients are ahead of time, but what you do is you take a, you take a training set of data of known examples that, show, that have the relationship that you want to model, and then you use a learning algorithm to look at that data and find what the coefficients of the function should be so that they model the, the thing that you're trying to model very well. That's the problem statement of machine learning, of supervised machine learning, which is like one category of machine learning, you could say. So for example, suppose you have a, a function that you're trying to learn, which takes an image of, of something, uh, like a number, and it tells you what number that is, right? So like we look at this and we go, oh, that's a nine, right? But uh, of course we take for granted how hard it is to actually recognize that there's all these different kinds of nines that people draw. And to a neural network, of course, or to a machine learning, to a computer, uh, that's, not, that's not obvious at all. So like to a computer, what a nine actually looks like is this. So but wait, uh, this right here, right? Or an image of a number. Here's an image of a zero, right? And this is what it actually looks like, right, to a computer. So how can you get a computer to uh, actually tell you what number that is? And that's really important because that's the basis for uh, optical character recognition. So like uh, whenever, when I'm in China for the first time and I go to a place to eat and I can't read anything on the menu, I can put my phone uh, that has the Translate app that, that takes an image of the, of the menu and then it finds all the characters and then it translates them for me. So that's, that's mind blowing, right? And that's really, really useful um, so that I don't, you know, so that I can find, you know, what, what, what I'm looking at, right? And uh, it uses machine learning to do that, actually in several stages. So how would this work? So what you would do is you can, let's see, I think it's this right here. Yeah, so for example, you could, you could set this up. I just have this in the slides, actually. Um, you have a neural network that uh, would look like this. So I'll describe a little bit how this works. So you have these like neurons, right? They're inputs. And they take in all of the pixel values. So that becomes your input vector, right? And this input vector has, happens to have 784 neurons. Why 784? Because these images that it's receiving are 28 pixels by 28 pixels. So that's 784. Right? So it takes in the raw pixel values, and then it propagates those values forward through a series of connections to another set of neurons that are, let's say there are 15 of them. And, and why 15? Don't worry, it's just arbitrary. Uh, but let's say there's 15 of them. And then they, they do something. They like combine that, those values in a way that I'll show a little bit more specifically in a second. And then finally, at the end, there are 10 output neurons where it does the same thing. The information goes forward. And there, now there's 10 output neurons, and each of them correspond to a digit, 0 through 9. And the idea is that we want the network to have the following behavior. When we give it an image of a 9, the neuron that stands for 9 has a high value. When we give it an image of a 2, or something like that, the, uh, let's see if I have, well, I think I had, let's, I don't have it, but a slide, but when we give it an image of a 2, it'll have a high value for 2 and a low value for the others. Right, so now at first we don't know how to do this because you know if we give all the if we give the network if we give this function a bunch of random coefficients, then the behavior of the function will be random also. But it turns out that through what's called a learning algorithm, and the learning algorithm that is favored now is something called uh, either depending on whether you're talking about uh, well it, the mathematical technique is called gradient descent which um, we're not going to really talk about in, because in, in detail because we don't have time. Um, and then the, 
like computational algorithm that implements gradient descent is something called backpropagation. So you might hear these terms if you're if you're reading about things in machine learning, especially scientific literature, you'll hear about backpropagation and gradient descent all the time. And if you want to learn in more detail how they work, you can actually like go if you click on ML for A in this website, these four chapters basically describe in like a lot of gory mathematical detail how, especially this chapter, how neural networks are trained, exactly what backpropagation and gradient descent are. But for our purposes, just assume there's an algorithm which can figure out what these numbers should be uh, in order to make it have, make it output what we want on a data set that we know the correct answers for. So does that, that's the basic high level idea of neural networks, okay? And then I have a few slides that kind of describe like, okay, you, well, let's, let's actually skip this one. I'll show you um, the, the, the small demo. I want to uh, show you this very, let's see, um, this one, I think. Oh, um, where's my demo? Simple forward pass, yeah. So uh, this is, so uh, I just want to note that like this is a demo that shows a really basic forward pass. Don't worry too much about the math. Um, it's not super important for us, but I wanted to just show it to you so that you can see that it's not, it's not black magic. It's like uh, it's something that you can actually like understand. And and actually the mathematics behind neural networks are actually uh, relatively simple compared to things like quantum mechanics or something, which it goes way over my head. Um, the math inside of neural networks is addition, multiplication, maximum, uh, and and like a little bit of calculus if you want to know how they're trained. But the actual forward pass is like really, really simple. It's just multiplications. So what happens here is that it receives some input. And each of these connections has, uh, they're called weights or parameters. And the idea is that when you receive an input, the, these values pr propagate forward with a, with a very simple formula where basically like the value that goes in here is the weight, it's a weighted sum of the, these inputs. And then through some nonlinearity, and nonlinearity is like some function which makes it not flat, because you know something this like 0.3 times 1.3 plus 0.7 times 2.8, and so on. It's very it's flat. It's a linear function which is very limited, and so instead we use nonlinearities, and we don't have to worry too much about what they are. If you like, if you know what a sigmoid function is, if you've taken like you know a statistics course or something like that, you might be familiar with that. Um, otherwise, actually, the ones that are used now is just maximum of, of this and zero. So that, that's it. Like, and don't, again, like I'm going really fast through it because it's not actually important for our purposes. I just want you to know that you can actually read the equations and they're, they're quite simple. Um, it's just like plus and times and then maximum. And then this goes like, but the thing is what, what's cool about it is that the reason why these networks can behave so complicated is that each unit is, is really simple. However, there's in a typical neural network, there's like 100 million units. And so you get very complicated behavior from many, many hundred million units behaving very simply together. Uh, and that's kind of like this emergent behavior, which, which makes it really actually quite interesting, I think. Um, so you get this value at the end. And the idea is that if we have the correct weights, we can get the value at the end that we desire which is typically the correct value in the training set that we know that we know the correct values for. So for example, if we have digits that we want to recognize, we can input them into a neural network so that the pixels become the inputs to the network. And then what we want is to get a the high value for nine when the when the, when we get an image of a nine, and a high value for a two when we get an image of a two, and so on. And then through the process of training the network, which means giving it data, samples of known inputs and outputs, and then using gradient descent via backpropagation to find the weights, we uh, find, we, we get an answer that works pretty well. And this is kind of a visualization that shows some of the weights. Um, what's cool about neural networks is that they learn to represent, like in order to be able to solve the task, they learn a representation of things. That's the way kind of we think about it, is that they learn what things sort of look like. Um, and so, for example, it learns what digits look like. And you can do these visualization experiments. Again, I don't have enough time to talk about these in much detail, 
but you can read about them in those chapters or you can also uh, go to the classes here and I've done lectures about these things that are, you can find here um, so for, for more detail if you're interested um, so that's MNIST right now uh, I want to really briefly mention what are convolutional neural networks and this is basically the uh, innovation that was made like relatively recently that makes them work really well. So like the, we've actually used had neural networks since the 1950s, right? So why are we only hearing about them now suddenly? Well, the point, the thing is though, that we, although we've had these neural networks for a long time, uh, part of the reason why they fell out of favor in 1970 was because they, 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 they seem to be not progressing. They were getting better and better and we made them bigger and bigger, but they kind of stopped getting better and better. And at some point people were like, we need something else to, to get us over the hump. And then so a lot of other algorithms began to be researched. So during the 90s and 2000s, the dumb, like when, even when I got started, which is just 2008, um, my professors were, said that neural networks were dead. Um, they were like totally dead. And that's what ev almost everyone in computer science thought that neural networks were dead. And the reason was that they didn't seem to be improving. And we had these algorithms like support vector machines and decision forests, which no one talks about anymore. Um, but at the time, in the 90s and 2000s, people thought that those were the answer. And they were, they were incrementally getting better. Um, but then a, like a very, very small number of machine learning scientists um, who are now all incredibly ultra famous because they were like a very small minority of scientists who believed that neural networks actually would uh, sort of, they, they, they had hope. Um, so if you've ever heard of the names like Jeffrey Hinton, who was, uh, like a, who was a professor of computer science, basically now retired, um, and Jan LeCun, maybe some people know the name Jan LeCun, he's the director of AI research at Facebook now. Um, and basically like those guys and a few, a few others, they uh, were working on neural networks throughout the 90s and 2000s and uh, figured out how to apply back propagation to them and some, other, and some other things. And basically what ended up happening was that they and all of their students and all of their students' students are now like the top scientists in the field. Um, so that's what happens if you have a crazy idea and it turns out to be right, um, is, uh, it, well, is that. Um, now, uh, now here's the way, here's what they figured out, wh wh why neural networks can be made to work. Um, so they started trying to figure out how to make neural networks do this process called convolution. And the idea of convolution is that instead of trying to find, like instead of trying to find a nine or try to find a seven or trying to find a four, you know, the images, you think of each image class as a sum of several parts. So maybe a nine is like a, a line and the, and the loop, right? And it turns out actually, and I think I might have some, yeah. It turns out actually that, that the brain sort of works this way. So like they've done, there's research that dates back to the 1950s and 60s by neuroscientists, these ones in particular, Hubble and Weasel, they get um, cited a lot which says that the, the human visual cortex works kind of like this. Basically, you have a bunch of neurons that are very closely connected to your retina that all they can do is detect edges, like really simple things. Like you see a signal on the TV, like of a line, and they detect that. They fire uh, when they see those things, right? And then those neurons, they fire to another set of neurons that are a little deeper in the brain. Yeah, take those edges and they combine them into corners or, or squares or, you know, like simple shapes. And then there's another layer of neurons that goes farther back that those uh, neurons push their signals to and they take the squares and the, and the, you know, ellipses and the grids and they combine them into more complicated shapes. And then another layer turns those into objects. And basically you have this sort of hierarchical way of, of vision where you take small patterns and combine them into bigger patterns and so on. And um, before we, we, we like origin, the, the neural networks that I just showed you that were doing image classification on, on digits, they didn't work, they worked pretty well. You could get a 90% accuracy, right? That sounds great, right? Like A minus, right? Uh, but 90% accuracy is terrible for, for, for like uh, recognizing digits, right? So for example, like if you wanted to do, one of the first applications that they had them do was reading checks. 
So you know, you you would write how much money you're giving to someone in a check, and the computer would would read the numbers and deposit money from your account to someone else's. Can you imagine if if they were only 90% of the numbers were correctly classified? Like a lot of people would be very upset, um, and a lot of people would be very very happy um, actually. Uh, um, but basically, like they have to have 99.9% .9 accuracy, which is what they do now. And the way they figured that out is by by doing this process where instead of looking for a cat pattern, you know, like like you have all these cats, right? And really hard to find pictures of these on the internet, I tell you. Um, so cats, like, why are they more complicated than sevens? You know, for example. Well, cats, like, first of all. Um, these are these are color images, so that's right away. That's three times more data, and cats can can like they can be facing different directions. They can be curled up or outstretched. You know, like sevens are not backwards sometimes, right? Like it's a there's a lot more diversity in images of cats than there are in images of sevens, and of course the images can be cluttered with other objects and things like that. So it's a lot more difficult, and so the idea is instead of trying to recognize just the cat, maybe first you recognize whiskers and ears and tails and fur and then combine those things into a picture of a cat and that's also useful because whiskers can help you find cats but they can also help you find dogs right so you can reuse feature detectors you have these neurons that respond to simple things and then combine those simple things into more complicated things but it can reuse the features and so that's kind of like what convolutional neural networks do and so they, they have this sort of local localized approach um, again, like we don't have time to really, really. Um, th they also, oh, I should mention really quickly, like there was convolutional neural networks as early as 1980. So this uh, Japanese scientist Fukushima uh, wrote uh, the first convolutional neural network in like as far back as 1980. And I think maybe like it's actually very controversial uh, within the, the academic machine learning field. Like people fight about you know where these come from. Uh, you can find like a lot of well. It's, that's just a whole other topic, but but uh, it's controversial where these things come from. But but as far back at least as 1980. Uh, but the problem is they didn't work yet because we couldn't solve them with backpropagation. So we kind of had this idea that like maybe these would work really well, but we couldn't come up with algorithms that would solve them effectively. And so it took until like literally 30 years um, for them to to, to to solve this problem uh, using a bunch of technical uh, innovations that we won't really cover. Um, so convolutional layers look kind of like this. You have these feature detectors that slide across the image and uh, look for a particular pattern, right? And they find, and you get these responses, these what are called activation maps, right? So this is like a particular filter that's a bunch of weights, and it's looking for this pattern uh, all across the image. And then, it, 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 and then it's colored brightly wherever that pattern exists, and wherever that pattern doesn't exist, it's kind of dark. So that's like the basic idea, and it's and it's actually a really simple operation. It's just a dot product. So if you ever if you know what a dot product is, it's just the element wise sum or element wise products summed. Um, so this this times this plus this times this really simple like algebraic operation. Um, and okay, convolutional layers. So let me show you a quick demo. So this is a convolutional neural network running. Inside of open frameworks, inside of my slides, isn't that cool? Um, that's the upside of having slides that break on you, um, is that you can do, at least you can put software in them. So basically, here's the idea. So you have these convolutional filters, and they look like this. Now you might ask, why do they look like these, right? So the, the short answer is they're learned through gradient descent, right? So you don't have these in the beginning, you actually learn them through training. So they're weights, just like the, any other weights that we've seen so far. Um, so you have these filters, and they give you all these responses, right? So some are looking for horizontal edges, and some are looking for vertical edges. Some are looking for like consistent color, and so on. And then um, what you get is you get these responses, and then you put them together into like a new image. And when I say image, is like you can you st you still see me in there, right? But and now you can think of all of these things together as like an image, except this image has instead of a red, green, and a blue channel, it has 96 channels, and each of which co uh, indicate the presence of a particular pattern in the original image. So this is our new sort of meta image, in, you, could, you could say in some sense. 
And then what happens is, from there, you, get, you can do another round of convolution. You have a new set of filters that look for patterns in the original patterns. The patterns that are here, you can find new patterns inside of them here. Right? And so you still see me in there, right? But now the patterns are kind of more complex. Like it's hard to tell even what, what really they're looking for, but they're looking for something that's a little bit more complex. And what happens is you do another convolution and another convolution and another convolution. We've done, this is now our fifth convolution. And now the patterns are becoming very abstract, but some of them are actually very much interpretable. So check this out. So this is my favorite neuron, 156, here it is. See that one? What does that look like? It's a face, right? And if I block my face, right, it goes away. Right? And you could try, like we could put multiple faces here. I could even put pictures of faces and it will respond for faces. So that's pretty cool because when this network was trained, no one told it about anything about faces, but it, it learned to find them because the task of, because finding faces was useful for the task that it was trained to do, which is image classification. So what happens is with this representation, we can plug it into a normal neural network without convolutions, just the sort of like, just the normal, like, like the neural network that we looked at a few slides ago, and then you could do really good image classification on top of it. So here, if I go to the last layer here, it's now giving me an ordered list of predictions of, of uh, different classes and the confidence. So if I put my phone, it goes iPod, right? right? And if I put, right? like if I put oxygen mask, bow tie, nipple, right? Yeah, <laughs> Windsor tie. It's, it, well, I mean, it is a weird water bottle. We have a lot of lighting too. It usually works okay with water bottle. There's a lot of, oh, oh this, I think this is a good one. I think it has a microphone. Microphone, yeah. We had microphone at some point. Okay, one dumbbell, yeah. Well, one, all right, it has a microphone in there, so I promise. It has weird lighting. Anyway, um, notice that whenever Whenever I'm there, it's just like Windsor tie, bow tie, right? Like, why do you think it would have a bow tie? Do I look like a bow tie? Right? <laughs> like, <laughs> and, and, and it makes sense because the thing is, all it gets is images of bow ties, but most images of bow ties have faces on top of them, right? Like, like that's what you have your da data set is usually has, uh, usually has that, and it can't distinguish necessarily between the things that it was trained to find and then things that just happen to be correlated with it. Right, so like for example, uh, one <laughs> when I first looked at this, it was uh, the first thing it found was wig. It's like, yeah, wig, because I had really long hair at the time, and I was like, it's very upsetting, you know. It's like I have lo exactly lobster, yeah. It's like lobster, but then. But then I, I thought about it, and it, it actually like it actually totally makes sense. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, that's that's this demo, right? So um, okay, so now another thing is, and actually this this is something I'm gonna save because we're gonna talk about this on another another day. What neural networks see? So I'm gonna actually skip these slides. I'll just say one sentence about them. You can do these experiments to actually try to find, figure out what neural networks actually see. So like, or what the neurons are individually looking for. So we saw that one is looking for faces, right? But can you do other experiments to try to figure out what, what different neurons are looking for? Because it's actually quite difficult to do. And there's a bunch of techniques that you can use that like tell you things like, okay, this neuron likes things that look like that. This neuron li likes things that look like this. You see there's a little bit of patterns this one's cool. It looks for text and barcodes and things like that. Um, but we're gonna, I think, I think either tomorrow or Wednesday are gonna, we're gonna look at something like this a little bit in more depth. So I'm gonna actually skip these. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about some applications of deep learning, and then uh, we're doing pretty good on time. Okay, yeah. I'll tell you some applications, and then we'll we'll try to look, do some quick demos in the browser. 
So um, application deep learning. Uh, oh, what? I keep saying deep learning now, right? So I snuck that in. So what is this term? How many people have heard of deep learning? So this is a term that has emerged in the last, t technically it goes back maybe 10 years, but it was just a m very minor academic term. Over the last five or four or five years, it's become like a very, very widely used term. And it came from academia itself. And basically deep learning is supposedly a branch of machine learning, or some people more cynically say that it's just a rebranding of neural networks. Um, but basically the deep means that there's multiple layers of, transfer, uh, of processing inside of the algorithm. So these, these neural networks, I showed you that like the last one we looked at had like something like 10, 12 layers. So you can have many, many layers, and at each layer you have more and more processing being done to the data. And so this is kind of what deep means. It just means there's many layers of processing, and people, and that's a very prominent feature of, uh, of neural networks now. And actually, like most of the machine learning before then, support vector machines and decision forests that I mentioned, you can consider them a sort of shallow learning because they don't learn, uh, because they, they usually have one or two layers of processing, and they also typically don't operate on the raw media. So that's another thing that now you can do with deep learning is that you can just give it raw images instead of like having to find some, use some computer vision techniques or something to give you a more abstract representation first. Um, that may not make sense to everybody, but, but, like, uh, but that's kind of like the basis for the term deep learning. So what can you do with it? A lot of computer vision tasks. So detecting whales inside of ocean pictures, uh, tracing the dots on satellite images of, of like finding roads, um, detecting galaxies, synthesizing speech. So that's what wave nets are. Um, and the Lyrebird demo that I showed you, that was actually, even though convolutional neural networks are usually associated with computer vision, they can also do sound, they can do text, they can do like all sorts of things. Um, they are, there's a huge exploding field in like in medical applications. This is probably one of the biggest um, like exploding areas, uh, application areas of machine learning. Uh, you're now seeing these like, uh, uh, like software that can uh, analyze images like of MRIs and CAT scans and X-rays and things like that and detect, uh, you know, like abnormalities in them, right? And so it, you can imagine like how useful something like this is in places where there's no hospitals for miles and miles and miles. Um, so this can actually like potentially be used to assist like, uh, like, you know, any, uh, like hospitals and doctors and things like that. Um, you can do diagnostics on your phone. Um, so this is like a really, really big area. And of course, computer vision is a, another huge area. So self-driving cars are on the roads now. Um, self-driving cars, like five years ago, would have seemed very futuristic, right? Like for our cars to be riding themselves. But now probably many people here have already possibly ridden in the, in the self-driving car that's assisted by a human driver. Right, so there's like Uber has done that in a few cities where you have these, where you have taxis that are driving themselves. They have a human behind the wheel that can, that can sort of like, it's assisting them kind of. Um, but actually just three months ago, I believe, um, Waymo, which is a self-driving car company owned by Google, which acquires everything that can do anything interesting, um, Waymo, is piloting self-driving cars that do not have drivers at the wheel in major US cities now. So I think in Phoenix uh, was the first place to have a fully autonomous car on public roads um, and making rides. And it's, it's so, so it's really getting, that, and that's just a few months ago. So that's, that's actually like a very, very, very uh, new thing. And I think like probably in five years that will be very mainstream. And in 10 years, it will be very normal for everyone to, to get like, um, to go from point A to point B in self-driving cars. There'll be a lot less cars in the road. And I think in 20 years, it may very well be like that, um, like humans driving cars is something that you only do for recreation. You know, like, like it will be illegal to do it. Um, that, that's serious. Like it will possibly be illegal. You can imagine um, in the future, it might, it might be that like humans no longer drive themselves to places. Um, and you know that could be a really good thing if you think about how many like car accidents there are. Like if 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 machines are better at it, that actually could have a lot of really good, um, really a lot of good positive benefits. 
Um, and also, I want to mention Convolutional Neural Networks were involved in the big AlphaGo victory. How many people here, that must have been pretty big news here, right? AlphaGo, how many people here remember AlphaGo? A few people, so, and maybe people don't remember what AlphaGo is called, but do you remember in the news how a machine, a uh, an AI beat the world's top Go player? Right, so Go is a, is a game that's, of course, very popular in East Asia. Is What's the Chinese name for Go? Is it, is it? Weichi? Okay. So, of course, like, it, like it's not very popular in the West, but, um, but it's, of course, very popular here. And, and, and uh, DeepMind, which is a company that's dedicated to solving artificial general intelligence, they made an AI, a machine learning, it was just using convolutional neural networks, um, that was able to beat Lee Sedol, the top ranked player in the, I think, the, or the top, or the second ranked player in the world, uh, but like the most decorated Go player ever um, of South Korea. And, um, and now actually like, now basically the software is online. So um, world's top Go player is now just open source software, um, which is, and, that, and that's really interesting because 20 years ago, roughly, we first developed an AI that beat the world's top ranked chess player. Um, a, a Gary Kasparov, so that was like 20 years ago, IBM Watson, uh, well, or no, it was, yeah, it was IBM Watson, I guess, and, uh, sorry, not, not Watson, IBM Deep, Deep Blue, and at the time, um, that, that seemed like a big deal, but the thing is that the, the AlphaGo thing is way more interesting, because first of all, Go for a computer is much harder than chess, because the game space is so unlimited, so the number of possible game states that you can have in Go is uh, something like 100 orders of magnitude larger than the number of game states you can have in chess, which means that like if, 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 there, are, if there were 100 positions that you could have in chess, then the number of positions that you can have in Go would be like, like, like this 100 times, basically. Um, so a really, really large number of game states. And also, uh, the, the algorithm that which defeated the world's top ranked chess player was very, very, uh, like, uh, it was created by a bunch of, like, 100 chess players making an algorithm that was very, very specific for chess. But the thing about the Go thing, Go, is that the algorithm itself was very, very general. It basically doesn't know anything about the rules of Go at all. It just knows images. Um, and it processes it with as few assumptions as possible, which means that the algorithm can be, can be applied to other things besides for Go. So now they're trying to use it to solve other video games, uh, but also just anything that requires vision, um, it's, it's actually like very, very, it's not that far removed from, from you know, just a general purpose algorithm which makes decisions based on what it sees. Um, so that's really, really interesting. So, and that's kind of like gonna be developed more over the next few years, I think. Um, and of course, just to mention, like this is graphics that show that like this field has received a ton of investment. Like like the amount of investment in companies has like doubled and doubled and doubled multiple times over the last few years. So now, like it used to be like in 2000, let's say 12. In 2012, the major tech companies, Google, Facebook, Baidu, um, you know. Amazon, whoever, they would have maybe two machine learning scientists on staff. Um, and now they have entire floors that are dedicated to it, right? Um, Sundar Pichai, the, Google, the CEO of Google, says machine learning is a core transformative way by which we are rethinking everything we are doing, right? And he also said, uh, this is great. AI is more important than fire and electricity. He said, he said it's more profound than fire and electricity. So that's like, and then also, um, <laughs> yeah, so Justin Timberlake's last video. Okay, this is, this is Justin Timberlake's last video. Pan-Asian Deep Learning Conference in 2028. So, so you, know, you know like you've hit peak, peak hype when uh, Justin Timberlake releases a music video about deep learning, right? So, and, so, and, and Sundar Pichai says that, uh, that machine learning is more important than fire. Um, so that's like, that's what we're up against now. Um, there's a really great community that's formed over deep learning uh, th th that's online. So this is a great thing. Like 10 years ago, if you, were for, if you were getting into machine learning, you couldn't really do very much unless you were in the university. Uh, but that's completely changed because now 
for example, all of the papers, all of the academic publishing is open access. All, all of the computer science papers go on archive.org. Um, in fact, whenever there is uh, an announcement of a, like a paywall journal, like Nature, the prestigious journal Nature, just announced that they're going to have a machine learning uh, journal that would be like a you know a journal that you pay for like their normal journal, and basically like all of the important scientists in deep learning wrote that they will not publish in it. So everything is open access. Uh, every a lot of code is on GitHub. Um, a lot of open source code like it way more than there used to be. It's a lot easier to code now because of things like TensorFlow and Theano and Keras and things like that. Torch. Um, there is. Kaggle, which is, uh, Kaggle got bought by, of course, Google, um, which buys everything, as I said. Uh, Kaggle, Google, so now it's like Google or Gaggle. Um, and Kaggle is a platform by which companies can release like uh, data science tasks they need, they need to be solved. And then anyone in the world can, uh, can like submit a proposal, uh, an algorithm, and whichever one does the best, they get, they get rewarded. There's, a, there's like a bounty. So a lot of like, you know, like bedroom data scientists are making a living, you know, working from abroad or whatever, just you know, on Kaggle, uh, basically doing these jobs for hire. And a lot of people are on Twitter and on Reddit, um, and uh, just discussing papers and research and everything. There's just a lot of like open air discussion now. And again, like all of this stuff was not really available ten years ago. Like it used to be that you know, unless you were in grad school, it would be like difficult to keep up with the field. Um, and then the, the last thing I want to mention is that the, um, some people uh, are beginning to uh, kind of see deep learning and machine learning in general and neural networks as a new paradigm for computing. So I, and I mean that seriously. So like the idea is that in software 1.0, there's a nice article about this by Andre Karpathy, which you can read online, which, which make, makes this case very well. Um, in software 1.0, you write code where you go, if, if this, then that, 4i equals 1 in 10, do this, x equals blah, you know, like basically writing code, right? And the idea is that now, instead of writing code in the future, you may instead be making programs where all you do is say, what are the inputs, what are the outputs, and you give it a data set, and then the program tunes itself it learn the program is learned, right? And the program is just an, is a neural network, and you have multiple functions in the computer that are all interacting with each other, and all of those are just neural networks that are communicating. One input goes into uh, produces one output, that output goes into another function, and 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 you have like basically um, just a new way of coding. You can almost think of it that way, and I think that's pro possibly true. So like I think maybe uh, in the future we won't really be writing code. And people often uh, object to this because they think like we've been writing code since forever, but that's not really true. Like when we started making computers, what we now describe as code didn't exist yet. What we had to do was write statements that like moved one memory in, from one container into another using punch cards, and then people created compilers to automate that process, and then they created programming languages to automate that process and then created higher level programming languages to automate the lower level programming languages. And there's always this series of like going higher and higher levels. And now you have things like MaxMSP, which I know some people are using, right? What it, MaxMSP is like objects inside of, uh, that, are, that have code inside of them, but you don't see the code. You just put the objects together and you, you, know, you design schematics that point that the objects are communicating with each other, right? And I think, like in the future, coding is going to be something like that. Like we won't be writing Python and JavaScript. We'll just actually be taking these high-level buttons and connecting them to each other, and maybe they'll be learned through through machine learning. Um, so that's kind of like, and even now kids are coding, right? So Scratch. Um, some people I, I saw on the list. Uh, I have a roster. Some people here are using Scratch or have seen Scratch. So that's like coding for kids. And you know, you have these blocks that have programs in them, and then they communicate with other blocks. So that's the kind of thing that you can probably look forward to. Um, and there's a term that some people use called differentiable programming, which is which some people find uh, some people like the term, some people do not. Actually, notably, this guy Andrew Karpathy does not like the term differentiable programming, <laughs> which he wrote the other day. But uh, the, the reason why they call it differentiable programming is that basically, like the the thing that makes deep learning work is that the function is differentiable. 
Because if you can, if you can do, if you can take its derivative, that's what differentiable means. That means you can back propagate over it to get the to to train it. So um, so the idea is any function which is which you can use put calculus on, you can learn um, through with data. Um, so but this may or may not be a useful term. But anyway, it's just kind of food for thought. Um, okay, so oh, oh let me let me. Um, before, this is the assignment, but actually, I'll get back to this. This is going to be what we want to do later. Uh, I'm going to talk about how to do this in just a little bit, but first I want to do, like, I want to do some quick demos. Um, and we have, let's see, so it's 8.25, um, so we have like a half hour. So basically what we're going to do now is I want to actually get you guys playing some stuff on your computer, and then I'll talk about the assignment. And the assignment is really easy, it's just to download stuff, um, but, um, but we'll talk about that afterwards. And uh, so yeah, let's do that. So here's what I want to do. I'm going to get out of the slides. And um, this is actually going to be a good test for us to see how the internet is. Um, because if the internet is strong enough for all of us to do these demos at the same time, then I think it'll be strong enough to do some other more complicated things. Um, basically, for those of you who want to follow along, I'd like for you to go to the following place, um, ML5 js.org ml5js.org that stands for machine learning 5 js javascript.org um. <coughs> and so you should see this website so first of all, I want to get a round of hands like how many people loaded that website quickly like it loaded quickly that's a good sign good sign um, I, I'm like very uh, skeptical of the internet because I just came back from mainland and it's like uh, that's like a serious problem. Um, so go to examples, right? Okay, click on examples. You should see something like this, and this will be a good test. So click on under examples. Click image classification. Actually, not image classification. Do yeah, actually yeah. Let's do image classification. Click on image classification. And you should see a demo, and then this will go, I guess this is a Robin, American Robin, something like that. Did you see that? Did, it, it, like, it may not have that right away, but you should see something like that, right? Okay. No? Some people are still waiting? So, oh, you, you, might, you might get different answers, sure. Um, oh, okay, okay, it's still waiting? All right, I'm curious to see how long it'll take. It might be that if we're all using, uh, like, we're, we all could be bombarding the website, uh, Try try reloading it. How many people? How many other people see dot dot dot? Oh, a lot of people. Oh, that's crazy. Um, I wonder why. No, 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 maybe, maybe, maybe. Okay, do the following. Those of you who know how to do this, can you open your developer console? It's like on on the Mac. It's Command Option, a uh, Command Alt I, and do you see any red? No red. Oh wait a minute! It might it might be that it's just downloading the model. No, it should be pretty quick. Did did it work for did it work for anyone besides for me? It's working now. Okay, so I think the reason why it worked for me quickly was because I already had the model downloaded in my cache, and you had to download it. Okay, it is working now. Not yet. Not for everyone. It should work like pretty soon. It's a it, it's not loading anything? Try reloading it. Oh, it is downloading something. Okay. So, all right, let me just describe what's happening. Like, basically, you this image classification demo... Okay, right, that's good. So, I if you haven't gotten it yet, what's happening is that this this demo, which we're, we're actually going to install it and run locally tomorrow, uh, what it does is it it's actually doing the image classification on your browser, on the client side. So basically there's an image of a bird or whatever, and then your browser downloads a neural network, which, is, which might be as much, it was like maybe 10 megabytes or 20 megabytes, I can't remember how large the model is, but it downloads it and then it runs your computer processing resources, like it's not a server client thing, it actually runs your computer to do the image classification with with this tensorflow.js and it tells you what's inside the image. For those for whom that worked, try to click the video classification demo and then it will ask you for permission to use the webcam 
if you haven't done it before, it, uh, it, it'll ask you for permission to use the webcam. And then you should see something like this where it'll start to tell you, okay, bow tie, seat belt, and so on, right? Um, I'm curious, okay, I want to see how many, for how many people that worked, or, and how many people that worked quickly for. How many people, raise your hand if that video classification is working for you, okay? Raise your hand if it's, if it's not working yet or it's like downloading. Okay, still downloading. Okay, so let it, let it go for a little bit and let's see how it goes. Was there, are there any questions? Some, so I'm curious because sometimes people have the same issues. Okay, okay. wanna be careful not to lose you guys. <laughs> Sorry? F five? Firefox, it should, it should, yeah. Okay, be, uh, okay. Uh, I want to, I want to quickly, I want to get everyone's attention back. So I, I just want I, the, the, the point of this is just so you see the, some of these things in the browser that you can do them. We'll actually be installing these tomorrow so we can develop with them. Um, another thing that you might want to try to do, like if I want to, I want to do this quickly, but this try the style transfer with webcam. So this will actually download a style transfer model and then if you click start right here it will basically turn your webcam it'll do the style transfer process on your webcam inside the browser on your computer gpu so that's pretty cool right it's actually running faster than the than the one that i had on my that i showed you earlier cubist mirror okay so this is a good test i just want to know like how many people like were able to get that running successfully because because it has to download, it means that all of us have to download, like, I forget how big it is, maybe 10, 20 megabytes. So times 100 people, that's a lot uh, for one network to handle. But it seems like people are having mostly success. Raise your hand if you're able to get that working. Raise your hand if you're still having problems with even the first demo. Okay, so these people. Raise your hand high, I want to be curious, okay. I just want to see, a, okay, there's a fair number of you. And the question is what uh, the question is whether or not it's a network thing or whether or not it has to do with something else. Uh, you, uh, I'll be care. I'll, I'll maybe I'll take a look at it later. I'll be curious to see it because um, that could be an issue for for some people. Okay. But I'm actually I'm encouraged by the fact that it worked for so many people because because that means that internet is pretty decent here. Um, okay. So I want you to stop. I want to show you some other things. Uh, you'll have time to play with these later, so just you have the links, so you can look through these later. Uh, but for now, I want you to like get out of the demo, and I want to show you another one. Um, please go to the following uh, following website. This is a little trickier to to write out. Okay, so go to andreasref.github.io/p5js underscore knn underscore demos. Uh, like uh, at least 10% of you will probably get a typo when you first write this out. Um, so so just like go ahead and, and look at that, and then just make sure you make sure you have that, and then we'll we'll go ahead and uh, sorry. Which number? What do you, what do you mean? Which number? Oh okay. Well we'll get to that. I just want to make sure everyone has the link. Um, uh, but basically. Let's try, let's do the first one, basic face tracking KNN. Okay, so I want to see how fast this works for everyone. So once you've gotten this, does everyone, does anyone need to copy this link? Please type it down quickly. So andreasref.github.io slash p5js underscore KNN underscore demos. And then click on basic face tracking KNN. And you should, it should, again, ask for permission to use your camera and you should have a face tracker running. It's not a very good face tracker. Sometimes you have to shake your head around for it to find you. Um, see, it's really, the face tracker is quite bad. Okay. So how many people have this? It's good. I, do you guys have this working? The, the, those of you, okay. So that's working for you? Okay. Okay. So uh, let me just describe what's happening here. And we're going to do a very quick experiment. Okay, so I need, I need everyone's attention. I need everyone's attention. So you have a face tracker here. It's not the world's best face tracker. It turns out that like none of the open source face trackers that work in JavaScript are that good. You can see that it's very, very picky about lighting and so on. So you can see like when I shake around my face, it's just gone. Um, however, what we have is a, is a face tracker that's working sort of decently. 
And we're going to try to train it to recognize different facial gestures that we make. So if you look at the instructions, here's what it says. Press 0 to 9 to change the current class. Hold mouse to record samples. So right now it's on training class 0. So what I want you to do is make sure the face tracker is looking at you and make, uh, make, a, like a, make a smiling gesture, like do this, <laughs> right? Smile. And then once you're smiling and it's detecting you, hold down the mouse for a few seconds. So watch me do it, and then you'll see end samples goes up. So watch this. So. You can, yeah, move your face around. Okay, and then you should see a zero pop up on the screen, right? So that means you've recorded class one with some number, maybe a few hundred samples. Then what I want you to do is click one, type one, and then you'll see training class one. So now you're, now we're going to train training class one. So what I want you to do now is open your mouth wide, like do this, uh, or something, or make some other face, and then record again with the mouse. So do this, uh, go, first it has to find me. I think the lighting is really bad for me. You probably have it better. <laughs> Come on. It's like really, yeah, there we go. Almost. Okay, once you've done that, once you've trained two gestures, what should happen is, as you stand in front of the, in front of the uh, camera and make those different faces, it'll predict which one of those classes you're doing. So I smile, oh, I open my mouth, Oh, it's not that good, actually. It's because the face tracker is really bad. Okay, which, if you trained it well, what should happen is that when you do the first gesture, you get a zero, and when you do the second gesture, you get a one. It's a little picky. It's like not, it's not a fantastic, like the problem is that the face tracker is like really janky, so you get like really bad results sometimes. But what's going on here, I just want to describe, like, there's a, there's a small neural network in here which takes the points. It doesn't take the image. It takes the points from the face tracker, and it, and it does actually, um, and there's, no, there's actually no neural network here. It's doing what's called k-nearest neighbors classification. So what it does is it just searches through all of your samples, and it picks the one that, 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 that it's closest to, and then it just copies its class to make a prediction. So it's the really, really, it's the simplest form of uh, classification you can do. There's no neural network. It doesn't work that well. Uh, we're going to do much more advanced things tomorrow, but at least you have that. So it's kind of neat. Okay. If you want, you can try some of these other demos here. These were made by Andreas. I mentioned some of his work earlier. Um, we're, uh, don't, don't do the webcam Pong yet because we're going to do that tomorrow. That one's really fun. Um, I, and, and actually, I have, a, I have a slightly better version of this that's going to be uh, useful for us tomorrow. Uh, but these are things that you can flip through later today if you wish. Um, okay, okay, we're gonna do one more demo. We're gonna do one more demo, and, um, and, then, and then we'll get, we'll kind of start to, to wrap up. So here's the demo I wanted you to do. And this, this one's really hard to actually find, so let me actually, instead of, uh, instead of memorizing this, instead of memorizing this, just Google, Google webcam transfer learning, um, T TFJS, something like that. So like if you go webcam transfer learning, if you Google webcam transfer learning tensorflow.js, something like that, it should be the first result. Um, you, oh, is it actually, uh, is it this one? Oh, wait, wait a second, maybe it's not the first result. It's like, oh, it's not the, the on, online demo. I just want to get like the fastest way for you guys to find the link. Uh, oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, what's one that works? GitHub page. GitHub page. Yeah. Uh, hang on a second. Uh, it's this. So yeah. Wait. Wait a second. What's a what's a URL trainer? GitHub. Bitly. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna copy that into, that's a good idea. <laughs> Paste the, okay, I'm gonna, okay, here it is. Bitly, bit.ly, two H E R capital H-E-R, B, capital X, I think that's a capital I. <laughs> case sensitive? 
Yes, I think so, yeah. So two capital H, capital E, capital R, B, capital X, capital I. Okay? Everyone got that? Two H E R B X I. Okay, everyone's got that? I'm gonna zoom out. I'm going to oh no. Okay, I'm gonna show you this demo. Everyone's got that? Anybody? Good. Yeah, exactly, yeah. I, I just wanted to find a good way of uh <laughs> oops. Not that. Okay, so here's what this is. This was developed by the TensorFlow team. So we're gonna we're gonna basically play Pac-Man with the webcam. So here's how it works. So you guys know Pac-Man, right? So in Pac-Man, you can go up, down, left, or right, right? So we're gonna train the webcam with a bunch of different images to associate them each with left, right, up, down, right? So here's what I'll do. Here's what happens. You see the, these four joystick buttons, top, right, left, and bottom? First, find some image that you want to do. Like, let's say, okay, one image I'm going to do is I'm going to put two things in my, my hand. So the first one is my phone. So I'm going to put my phone in front of me, and then I'm going to click and hold down the mouse button for, for the... Actually, I'll do right because it makes more sense. My right hand, right. So I'm going to hold down right and uh, just hold it down for a little while. And I'm going to try to move around the phone, like whatever the focal point is, to give it a bunch of samples, different samples. And you see that it's basically recording samples. Okay, you see that I've recorded 173 samples, all images of my phone, and I associated them with the right thing, right? Now what I want to do is do to select a different image. Let's say the water bottle for me. And then I'll basically put that in front, and I'm going to click and hold it on the left. Okay, and maybe move the water bottle around a lot. Okay. And then, and then what I'm going to do is uh, the top one I'll associate with just me. Like, like me kind of like, let's say me closing, close up. So like this. Hello, everybody. <laughs> okay, so getting a bunch of samples. A lot of you have probably figured out exactly what's going to happen here, right? So it should be obvious by now. And then the back one, and then I'll, I'll zoom out, and I'll do this one like me farther back for bottom. Okay? Once you have collected enough samples, you click Train Model, right? And it's going to train it, and it'll take a few moments to do that. It's going to train a neural network to predict which of the four classes is that you're, that you're you're acting out, right? Okay, so it's trained it, and by the time it's trained, you can click play, and before you do, just know what's gonna happen. Basically, as soon as you click play, the Pac-Man game is gonna start, and you have to move it around, so you have to remember how it works. So like, okay, I'm gonna, so like, like, okay. It's really hard, actually, it's like, go, go down, and then, Oh, oh no! <laughs> uh, it's it's actually quite difficult. <laughs> uh oh, eh. it's not bad. I actually I usually lose within the first five seconds. Um, so, so play, play around with that for a little bit. Um, if you feel like, yeah, I don't know if you'll have more success than me. Did, it, did it, this work for you guys? It, it's working? It is? Okay. Be curious about that other demo, why that didn't work. Um, so so we're, we're, this is actually a taste of what we're going to do tomorrow. Like We're going to actually basically download the, the template of this, and we'll be able to try to make our own like small games if we, if we want to try. Um, for those of you, and, and that'll be a little bit more coding involved. Um, and you'll see how easy it is to kind of develop web apps. So, so this, this demo is pretty cool. So like a few things that are worth mentioning. It all runs inside the browser, right? So, and, and, and it uses your computer's GPU for processing, um, which is another cool thing. 
and it has a small neural network that can process images. So that's that's the cool thing about it. Okay, so maybe take a moment to like play a little bit more with that. And okay, and then we'll we'll kind of <laughs> wrap up that part there. Okay, so I want to I want to get everyone's attention like in the next 15 seconds. So I know it's a lot of fun. You'll get to play it later today, but I, I, we have 15 minutes left, and I have, I have a few more things I want to accomplish. Um, so what I'd like to do now is um, basically tell you what I basically I'll do the assign. Let's see how we should do this. So I'll do the assignment first. The the assignment is is really is just to get ready for tomorrow, which is to get some stuff. Um, and I'll describe that in just a second, and then I'll, and then that will that's all that we need to accomplish today. And then I'll ha I have one like fun thing that left over that we'll try to do. Um, so okay, so here's the assignment. Is I had the slides here, so let me just quickly pull those back up. So basically, I want you to download something, and um, the the thing that you're downloading may actually change slightly be between uh, between now and tomorrow when we. <laughs> When we start, because I'm, I actually like. Uh, so as I said, this is very new. Like TensorFlow.js, I don't usually have this in my workshops. So this is kind of like still bleeding edge software. So I'm actually like preparing more stuff that will probably be in it tomorrow. But uh, but just in case, like it's hard to download on the spot, it'll be nice to try to download it. Um, it'll be nice to try to download it be ahead of time. So this is the link that I want you to have. Um, yeah, this is a good idea to take a picture. Uh, github.com slash ml4a um, slash ml4a dash demos slash releases. Okay, so um, maybe I wonder if there's a way for us to like share links easily. Uh, I could make like a pirate pad or something like that. Would that be a good idea? Um, because I, I suppose I don't have any everyone's email or anything. What's a good, what's a good, uh, paste bin? Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do I'm going to make a paste bin. Um, I, I'm gonna put that. I'm gonna put that link in a second. Let me just go to paste bin. Uh, okay, so let's give it a name. So I think it's like a uh, new paste, right? This is the ha we have to give it a name, right? Like, uh, isn't it usually like um, what? What should we call this? Um, ML. Yeah, but that's probably been used already. How about ML for a um, C U H K. Well, I see him. I see him. Yeah, M L for A. <laughs> what was that? Did I? Is that is that not correct? <laughs> oh, is that? Uh, I thought City University. Yeah, yeah. Oh. C U H K is Chinese University. Oh, I thought. Oh, okay. I thought, but I thought it also stands for City University. Is that? <laughs> Is that a faux pas? Yeah, it's like. <laughs> Wait, how do I how do I uh, ML for ASCM? Like this paste name title? I don't actually remember how to do this. You have to. You cannot. Cre oh, okay, okay. So basically, the link is this. So this, and oop, and this. So, public, ML for ASCM. Ah, there we go. Uh, oh, gee. <laughs> okay. That's the first. Okay, so that is, so you should have this now, which is not any easier to memorize than the other. But we can, but, but keep track of it because we can at least, um, we can at least use this to share links. So maybe just like memorize this. Or, or write it down. So C H, so C capital H one capital T, capital W capital H Y capital S. Okay, pastebin.com slash. So we'll use this to share links in the future. Um, so I'll make note of that as well. Okay, and then the top link over here. Has everyone got that? People still. So yeah, take a picture. That should be visible. Okay, and um, and then the first link that you'll see there is the is the link for uh, the releases page of ML for A demos. And then basically, what I'd like for you to do, can I zoom out? Anyone still copying? Giving three, 
giving two, giving one, and <coughs> zooming out. Um, so basically, in the releases, when you see this, you see ML4A-workshop kit. That should be the top thing. Basically, I want you to install, uh, I want you to download. Here's what you need to do. Just download this file. Actually, I'll be curious to see if everyone can download it now and not clog up the internet, because then, uh, be, so like, let's just try to do this now. Um, click on jsapps-zip. Everyone will need this, so just click on this, and it should start to download. It's like 60 megabytes, so it's not that bad. Um, so I'm curious to see how fast this will download for everybody. Raise your hand if you're, de if you're done. Like, we're overloading GitHub. Two hours left. Two, oh, okay, yeah. all right, yeah. So this is, this is why I wanted to do it overnight, so like everyone can do this on their own internet connection and bring it in. Oh, okay, so now it's going faster? Okay. Okay, so that's not too bad, not too bad. All right, so for some people it might be going slowly, but it should pick up. Like this is a good, this is a good test to see, like, because there are certain things that will be, like, like, that will be difficult to do without fast internet for like a lot of people. Um, Okay. Hi, people finished the download? Did it finish for anyone? Not, not anyone yet. Okay, so it's, so it's going pretty slow, right? Like a few kilobytes a second or whatever. Okay. All right, fine. So that's, that was good for me to know. So basically, between now and tomorrow, please download JS apps and also download Weconator-processing. And then if you're on a Mac, download Mac install. If you're on Windows, uh, Windows install. And then I'm sorry, for those of you on Linux, I didn't prepare a, a Linux install, but it's actually really easy. Basically, what you need to do is, for, for anyone, um, the, the thing that's in the Mac install and Windows install is there's just three uh, things that you need to download, which you can get from their original links here. So you need Weconator, Processing, which both have uh, Linux versions. Uh, I think there's a Linux version of Weconator. There should be a Linux version of Weconator. Uh, I'm not 100% sure of that. And then brackets is actually optional. And if you're using Linux, you probably don't really need brackets. Um, but basically what, what brackets is, is it's a code editor that runs a local server. So if you already know how to do that, that's like a Python command, python-m simple HTTP server. You can just do that instead. You don't really need brackets. Um, so brackets is kind of optional, and I'll show you how to use both. But it's kind of nice to have. So, so like download these three things. So again, these three things come inside of both Mac install and Windows install. And then the, and then the processing work in there stuff is really small. So just between now and tomorrow, just try to download these. Um, and, then, um, and then basically, like, we'll, we'll be doing that tomorrow. And then the other thing that I want to talk about is, like, how to, like, I want to take care of this in advance. Uh, because this, this is, we're not going to do this tomorrow yet, but for those who are, who will be here on Wednesday through Friday, um, we're going to, I'm going to try to like, to the extent that's possible with such a large group, I want to do some stuff that involves cloud computing. Now I'm a little scared about the cloud computing because like this many people are trying to access the same cloud computers at the same time could be problematic with the internet. So like worst case scenario, what will happen is I'll just be doing demonstrations and we're recording it. So. Um, at the very least, like you'll you'll be able to do it when you go home. You don't have to follow along. Although, in the interest of being able to do it, possibly while I do it, we we all need to have some sort of a computational environment with GPU. So, if you have a comp if you already know how to do this, you can just do you can just do like uh, set up your own computer. If you have a computer that does video games really well, you can probably do it. Um, for those of you, as anyone here. How many people here, if anyone has used, like, let's say, Google Cloud Compute or Amazon Cloud Computation? Maybe just a couple of people. So these are, these are options. Like, you could set up, like, a, an environment that you could remotely log into. Now, the two easiest things, the, there's one really easy thing, but however, it's a little bit limited, which is Google Colab. So Colab, Colaboratory, is a really, is a new feature by guess who? Um, Google. Um, which basically lets you spin up computers in the cloud for free. Um, so basically, like, we're, there's a few scripts that we'll be able to run, and, and, and you interact with it on the browser, but it actually sends the, does the, all the computation on Google's side and returns the results for you. Now, this will, will be able to do, we'll, we'll probably be able to do a couple things on this. Um, however, it, it's, it's free, and it's easy, um, and, and it's easy to the extent that all of us can, can access 
them at the same time. Like that's that's the whole internet thing. It's it seems like reasonable to think that that most of us should be able to do it, but I'm not sure in advance. So we'll see. Um, again, at the very least, we'll, we'll, you'll be able to do this afterwards. Um, and, and the other thing is you need a Google account. Um, so like, uh, I know not everyone, uh, not everyone may have one. I suppose like, uh, I suppose in Hong Kong, most people will have uh, accounts. Uh, most people in China do not, so. Um, so, but, but I suppose most people, do people here have Google accounts? Like, most people. If you, it, it's free, of course. Like, if you have a Google account, we'll be able to use Colab. Um, and that's probably the easiest and the most reliable. So I'd like for everyone to basically make sure you have a Google Colab account. Now the other thing that you could do, and we're, and and like uh, I don't have enough time to do a full tutorial on this, but there's a website that I use for a lot of my workshops called Paperspace, uh, which is basically a cloud computer that you rent, and you pay like something like 60 cents US cents. Um, so that's like, I guess, like uh, two do Hong Kong dollars, something like that, per hour uh, to rent a computer in the cloud. And, um, and it's, it's really user friendly. And basically, uh, I may end up using this also. Like, it's, it's still unclear which way will be the best. But for those who are interested in this, you can sign up for an, like, if you want to use the, okay, so here, here's the, I, I'm, I know I'm rambling a little bit, so let me, let me put it this way. So if you want to have the option that will give you the most flexibility to follow along during the class uh, itself, um, provided that we have internet to actually access it, um, then what I'd like for you to do is to go to paperspace.com, sign up for an account, and there's one other thing that you'll have to do, which is when you sign up for an account, you, uh, you'll get, you will see a screen like this, and I, I actually have a video lecture that I'll give you a link to in a second also. Um, so I did a whole lecture about paper space that I put online uh, here. So let me put, let me actually put this MP4 on the uh, the pirate the paste bin. So this right here in the in the demo is a paper space demo, and um, basically this this will uh, let you. This is like a 30 minute long lecture that I gave in another workshop just a few weeks ago where I described how to start a paper space account, how to create a computer and how to set it up to do neural style transfer, which we're actually going to do on maybe Wednesday or Thursday. Um, so uh, you may or, this is optional, totally optional. It's like for anyone who, who's interested in this, um, you, can, you can actually like, this will take you through the process of starting, uh, we'll actually do some of this possibly if paper space is usable in class. But definitely what I'd like for you to do is once you have an account, if you wish to, again, this is optional, um, you need to request access to GPUs from them. That's the one thing that you have to do. Um, so like once you'd have an account, you would see a screen like this. I see the web, now the internet is beginning to turn really slowly. So like this is kind of what I'm afraid of. Like with paper space, like if all of us are using it at the same time, it's like gonna be, because also they're a startup. So they, they have also limited resources on their side. Um, so yeah, we'll see. Oh man, this is this is churning along. Okay, regardless, like we may not end up using paper, like if it's going to be this slow, we'll probably not end up using it during the during the actual lectures. Um, however, um, it's still definitely worth it for you to investigate because at the very least, I'll show you how to set up an environment there, and it, then it becomes really easy uh, because it has all of the software pre-installed. They have these templates. I'll show you how to use them. Um, man, it's really bad. So, so okay. So this is something you can do once you get home. Uh, this is what you have to do, basically. And actually, I think I might have the. Yeah, if you watch the demo, since I can't access it, like the the video online that that goes through this process, what happens is you will come upon the console, and it's like a normal console. Uh, and then there's a you sign in. This is what we're trying to do right now, right? You sign in. You'll get to your console page. And then basically there's this button that says new machine, right? And just go to that. You don't have to create a new machine right now, but basically you just have to, you'll have to go to it. And then like when you, you basically get down to the bottom and you have to click on public templates. And when you click on public templates, what'll happen is if you're a new account, there'll be a pop-up that says you must request access for GPU uh, machines. And so uh, in, in, to do this, in a, it, they take maybe a day to get back to you. 
So like better to if you're going to use it, better to do it now. Um, you basically it doesn't cost any money to just request access. You basically request access. You they ask you to write a message, something like you can say I'm taking a workshop. You can even say you're taking a workshop with me. I talk to them a lot. They're like uh, a startup that that I'm using for workshops, and um, and then usually like they just do it to to prevent spam and stuff like that. Um, and so it's a really it's just a formality, and they'll give you access to these templates. And what the templates are is that they're images of machines. They're, they're images of computers that already have all the software set up. So basically, like we don't have to deal with installation and stuff. So that's kind of a nice feature about them. And you'll be able to do a lot of that stuff on Paperspace um, when I show it to you. We may or may not have the internet bandwidth to actually do it, like to, to have all of everyone doing it at the same time. But I will show you how to do it. So at the very least, like this will be a nice feature for you to use um, if you'd like to. Again, it's totally optional. Um, it is totally also an option to just to just watch. Like it's completely like uh, it'll still be educational for you. And of course, these are being recorded. My understanding is it'll be shared with everyone, right? So um, something like that. So like you'll will all all of this will be um, available to like recount the steps. I'm gonna do everything from step one. So like you'll you'll definitely have like what you need. So. Um, maybe it, maybe it turns out that we can't do everything like together, but but it'll be pretty close to that. Um, so okay, so the assignment is download that stuff. Everyone has the link, right? Um, and and then maybe just set up a paper space account if you if you'd like to. Um, so it is nine, but if you give me four four minutes, I can do this. I've done this in lectures before. Um, this is a really fun little surprise. Um, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do a little. Uh, we're going to do a little exercise together. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to train an audio classifier to classify a whole bunch of sounds, and then we're going to do something fun with it. So here's what, this is what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to set this on threshold mode, and you see this little line, this is an amplitude. So what I want you guys to do is when I do this, I want you to clap. So like, let's practice. Ready? Clap. You see how the volume jumped up? So I'm going to re we're going to record a bunch of claps and we're going to have it recognize claps, right? So on the count of three, I'm going to I'm going to hit record and we'll clap a bunch of times. Okay, ready? So hold on. And Okay? So that's good. So that's class 2, that's class 1. Now for class 2, this is going to be really silly, but you got to trust me. Um, so <laughs> So we're now. I turn off threshold mode, and we are. This is the only thing that really works well. Um, we're gonna ooh. So I want you to give me like one big long ooh, right? So as soon as I click record, start ooing. So uh, ready? And well, actually, start start ooing, and then I'll click record um, because because we don't want to record any silence. So one, two. Ooh. Good, good. That's good enough. And now, label three, we're going to ah, OK? And on the count of three, ah. Good, OK? And then label four, silence. Well, that's going to be our silence. So I'm going to record some silence. OK? So now, now let's, let's uh, train it. And now, try ooing. I think it'll be okay. Um, okay, so here's what what's going to happen now. So now I'm going to hook this up to a little program that controls my keyboard. So so basically these cl these predictions will actually like robotically tap. I mean not not like a robot, but they'll they'll like uh, tap keys in my c keyboard. So it's called Keyboard OSC, and uh, this is all available in the ML for OFX collection. And basically, I think this one. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to first change the settings, and we're going to make it so that one, number one is going to be the space bar. It's going to hit the space bar. Two is going to be, ooh is going to be left, 
is going to be the left key. Three is, ah is going to be right. And then four is going to be nothing. So it's going to be pass. So I'm going to save that. And now here's what we're going to do. We are going to uh, begin to, so this is running. And then now we're going to go to this. <laughs> so, so basically, here's the idea. I'm going to, as soon as, as soon as, does everyone know this game? You got to make the T-Rex jump over the cactus, basically. And the way you're going to do it is, it, 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 you, it, when you hit the space bar, it'll, it'll, um, it'll cl it, when you clap, it'll hit my space bar and it'll make a jump. Okay, so, so here's how it's going to be. I'm going to, I'm going to, let's, let's have this here. And actually, let's make this visible. Okay, I'm going to hit. Uh, allow keyboard simulation, and then it's going to start. All right. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Obviously, pass, pass. A little early, a little early. Yeah, that was good enough, right? So that's that's fun. Yeah. <laughs> so wait, wait, wait. One more. One more. One more. That. Oh, and let me. Okay. Mario Kart. <laughs> oh, is it not working? Hang on a second. <coughs> Got to get this thing to work. Oh, maybe it doesn't have flash or something. Oh, blocked by client. What? Hang on a second. Hang on. Super Mario Kart Online. I found this before. Oh, this one. Yes, this one works. Okay. So here's how this works. Now, so pass to go straight, be silent. To go right, you got to ooh. And then to go left, you got to ah. All right. So here's how it's going to So let's pick a player. Mario Okay, and here we go. Now this is it. Oh, oh no. <laughs> that's, all right, whatever. That's fine. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna hold the gas. So go straight, and then you gotta. Uh, uh, <laughs> not bad, all right. This is really hard. That's like ah. Uh, oh. All right, that's good enough. That's good enough. You guys get the idea. Oh no, it's it's okay. My keyboard's crazy. All right, so that's that's good enough for today. So that's all like uh, for today. So like yeah, tomorrow we'll come back. <laughs>